All right. Welcome, Curtis Little, to the Self-Employment Success Podcast. Thanks, Leland. Thanks for having me. Let's just dive right on in. Um, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and um, what you do, what your business does as it stands today? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I live down in Charleston um, and have lived here for a while. That's how you and I met um, the College of Charleston and um, have always wanted to get into real estate, was always super fascinated by it. Um, but getting into real estate means virtually anything. So that's like saying I'm in finance. It could mean anything. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different avenues in real estate. And so I just happened to kind of fall into the sector that we're in, um, which is called triple net retail. Um, and so basically uh, my partner and I and our company, we've got two employees now um, and we build restaurants for a bunch of national restaurant groups and then we sell them. So um, yeah, it's a, it's like a very much a deal business. Um, it's kind of case by case. We have a bunch of different projects happening at once. So, yeah. So, and just so listeners know, what's the name of your company? The name is Mount Oak Capital. And, uh, it's just the name of the name of the street that my best friend and I, who are business partners grew up on. Um, so Love it. not super creative, but. I remember you know. when I was uh, trying to name Peace Link and I was like way overthinking it. I was looking at like oh, Greek yeah. and Gaelic and all these like different, and it, yeah. it just, you know, simpler the better. <laughs> um, it's also, okay, so, I mean, the bar is pretty low in our industry. Um, there's some really terrible named companies and bad logos and people are finance people. They don't really, you know, put a lot of thought into that. So yeah, no one's fact, like a brand new specialist. We have, we have. We didn't want to spend any money on a graphic design, so had Blakely just sketch a little logo for us, and that's still our logo. Uh, that's that awesome. looks pretty good. I, yeah. Honestly, I think that's genius. Um, for yeah. listeners who don't know, uh, Curtis's wife, Blakely, is a professional artist and is does incredible work. Um, and so pretty nice to have that in the household where you can just be like, I need a logo. <laughs> I need yeah. a piece of art. Yeah. Yeah, to whips it out in about 10 minutes on our iPad, and there we are. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, okay, so Mount Oak Capital started with you and your best friend, and yes. you guys basically develop national chain restaurant buildings. Yes. Um, so like yeah. a Starbucks could call you and say, hey, we need a, location, a new building in San Antonio, and you guys yeah. would be in charge of finding that, buying it, developing it, and then selling it or yeah pretty much so want to. so we do i mean there are real estate agents still involved so like we'll use go with your starbucks example because we do work with them um they have a broker in every market that they're in so they have a broker here who's in based in charleston and she um selects or helps find real estate for them all over the the state of south carolina and so we'll work with her um, and she'll kind of present a bunch of opportunities. And then we have to look at them from a development standpoint and see if they work. So, um, you know, each each piece of real estate comes with, with a ton of their own challenges, whether it's, you know, like contamination, underground storage tanks, all kinds of stuff. Um, and so the numbers have to make sense because Starbucks is only going to pay so much rent. They have to succeed as a business too. They, mm -hmm. everybody, you know, they obviously have deep pockets, but each, each restaurant has to make money. So, um, it all kind of has to pencil and that's where it gets complicated. Um, you know, to give you an idea, let's just say we've got, um, an assignment from them. That's what we call them. So let's say Starbucks says, all right, we need one in, in Newport news, um, or in, um, Virginia beach. Well, we'll probably identify eight different properties and underwrite all of them. So we'll we'll put pen to paper and try and figure mm -hmm. out whether or not um, the deal pencils or not before we land on one. So it takes a long time. I mean, it it takes usually about a year from start to finish to even identify the right property. Wow. Um, yeah. Which is so funny because as a consumer, you drive around, and you're like, ah, 
they're putting in a Starbucks here. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a lengthy this journey process. probably just started. <laughs> yeah. It's been years in the making of them trying to figure yeah. that out. Um, wow. That's really interesting. And so how did you, like you said, real estate is so broad. You gave a great example. I feel like finance is that way. Anybody who says they work in finance is like, I'm, I have a heartbeat and I work with money. It's like, there's a exactly. million ways you could do that. How did you get in? What was your story or journey to get into this specific niche? Sure. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, they say, if you don't have any friends in real estate, you don't have any friends. It's just, everybody knows somebody That's a great line. Uh, in real estate um, that just could mean a bunch of different things. So yeah, no, I am. Um, I was in college and I knew I, at College of Charleston and knew that I was always interested in real estate. My dad um, was a civil engineer, so I was kind of always around real estate development. Um, I was fascinated by it. Didn't ever want to be an engineer. Um, seemed too painful. And uh, anyway, I ended up just through a, a friend of a friend with an internship in D.C., um, working for a company that built office buildings um, and then leased them to a bunch of different tenants. Like I remember at one point um, Uber had just started and we leased a big floor to Uber and it was like, we're, what is Uber? And anyway, it makes me sound old, but um, <laughs> they were, they were growing quickly. And, and so it was pretty random that I got into office to start. Um, I found it super boring personally. Um, mm -hmm. Some people love it. Uh, it is an office building; doesn't have a whole lot of character. And um, but I liked I liked the industry. I liked the pace of it. I liked the uh, deal by deal basis of it. Um, I also like the flexibility of of the schedule. I mean, it, you know, I think all real estate careers come um, in huge waves. So like. There'll be times where you're so busy and you're working, you know, 70 hour weeks. And then there's periods where it really cools down and you're working 40 hour weeks, but it, it kind of ebbs and flows. And so, um, I enjoy that. It just is, uh, keeps it from getting too mundane. But anyway, I, I liked being in commercial real estate. I knew I didn't want to do residential once I started, um, working for this company. So I interned with them and then I got a college or I got a job with them right out of college, just, um, in the DC in, area, that job. Yeah. Up there. In DC. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, it was great, but, um, really, you know, my career ended up changing more because I wanted to get back to Charleston than anything else. Um, mm. I, I wanted to get out of the office sector of real estate, but, um, didn't really know how I was, you know, 24 and, uh, didn't, didn't exactly know what I was doing. So I just by chance got a job with a company that was based in Atlanta and they wanted to have an office in Charleston. And really what that means is my boss had a house on Sullivan's Island and he wanted to um, expense his trips to his house and say that he had an office in Charleston. So the office was just me. Um, I which was, here, yeah. with all of my Charleston clients, you know, yeah, exactly. you know big deals it's happening. A great move on his part. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we would, and that company was a retail company. So we would, we would buy and sell buildings on King street. Um, and that's really what kind of the entrance point was into retail. And, you know, King Street's really awesome. It, it's, for those that don't know, King Street in Charleston is a, a pretty big, it's, it's the main shopping street where you've got all your national, you know, J. Crews and um, Anthropologies and all of those guys. Um, but that's a really small part of the retail sector. Like if you just look at the landscape of the U.S., a lot of it is suburban. Mm. And so there's way more opportunity in suburban markets uh, just because that's what most of the U.S. is. And so I really like that's called high street retail, um, King Street type stuff. And then I prefer that, but it's just really hard to only do that. Um, I'm sure that you're not the only person trying to do it, but there's only so much like you're yeah, working on one street. <laughs> exactly. 
So, I mean, if you just think about, okay, residential real estate, there are a ton of residential real estate folks. Like most, everybody has a friend that's a real estate agent. Um, well, that's because everyone has a house and then you distill it down even further to just commercial real estate properties. And that's across all sectors. That's apartments, that's office buildings, that's retail, it's industrial, all of it. Um, you know, that makes up about 20% of the real estate in the country compared to homes. Um, and then down further is retail and down further than that is high street retail. So there's just not a lot of opportunity. Um, other than one street in Charleston, uh, <laughs> there wasn't anyway. So ended up doing more and more in the suburbs and was, um, just having more success and, um, kind of fell into working with restaurants. So, um, I remember when I was working at this company, you know, Amazon really disrupted retail. Mm. Um, and you know, all the shopping centers were starting to struggle malls. I mean, we've all seen malls that are now just defunct, um, a lot to do with Amazon. And so retail ended up becoming more and more restaurant oriented, which I love because that's honestly, um, what I'm, I'm most passionate about. I love, um, you know, working with, with different restaurant groups and, and places where people can gather. Um, so I started to get experience working with all these different restaurant groups, most of which were like national chains like Chipotle and Starbucks and Chick-fil-A and um, even guys like Duncan and Popeyes and people like that that aren't the most exciting, but um, they're growing at, at quite a clip. So mm. that was the one company I was working for. And then I got hired by a different development group um, in Atlanta. Um, all the while I was getting my master's at Georgetown in DC, which was kind of like a hybrid distance learning thing. Um, I was kind of back and forth with, with DC um, and Charleston for two years. Um, made it easy that um, my family's in Maryland. So mm -hmm. I was able to go stay for free somewhere. Um, but yeah, I took a job with a company called Geyer Morris in Atlanta and um, was doing more and more development and really enjoyed the work um, all over the Southeast. I even had a project in Colorado. It was just very um, national development group. Um, and commercial real estate is that way more so than um, residential. You know, you kind of have to back to the inventory thing. Like there's just not as many commercial real estate opportunities. You've got to cast a wider net. So, um, yeah, got some really, really good experience, built relationships with tenants as well. So like the Starbucks people knew me. Um, and when John and I decided to start our company, I had these relationships. Mm. Um, which then, so we weren't going in totally blind, um, and weren't really reinventing the wheel. In fact, when John and I started our company, we we're pretty much doing the same thing that my old company was doing, just on a smaller scale. Um, so, yeah. So, okay. So you started in commercial real estate up in D.C., mostly with office spaces. Knew you wanted to get back to Charleston because, it, you know, it's, it's Charleston. It's Charleston. Yeah. yeah. And and Blakely's there. You know, you guys were getting yeah. engaged. And um, so transitioned to work with this company out of Atlanta who did, you know, you said high street retail was the name, but because that's, you know, just an intense market, there's not a lot of demand kind of moved yeah. you into more of the suburban areas, built these connections yeah. with connections with restaurants. At the same time, you, you switched jobs to be on, with more of a developer side of that and yeah. um, was getting your master's at Georgetown. And that kind of led you to being able to say, I think I can do this, what I'm doing right now independently yeah. with my best friend john and that's kind of how you guys stepped away from just you know the buying and selling piece into yeah. the now we're going to work with these connections we have in the restaurant industry to find underwrite and develop their properties is that that's right right that's exactly right um 
So John calls you, he says, you know, hey, we've always dreamt about starting a business um, or like going to work together and yeah. jump in on that. Was it, were, were there any nerves going from like this whole time you have been an employee? So like, yeah. what did that feel like? Was that just pretty, you know, we're confident in it and we're running with it? Or um, what was the transition like from going from employee to owner and now so employer I mean, of other people? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, there's obviously nerves. Um, there, there are nerves just because all of a sudden you're, you know, having to literally eat what you kill, and um, you've, there's no, there's no net to catch you if you fail. Mm. Um, I'll say this though: I think that real estate, in particular, there in real estate, there's less of a leap to entrepreneurship um, mm. and starting your own company because already you're on a kind of a deal by deal basis. So that's true. Um, each project is, is kind of its own little business if you think about it that way. Um, and so it's not totally foreign. Like I, I kind of already was running point on my own projects. Mm. And so it was less scary. I also think just doing it with my best friend kind of instilled confidence in me. Um, yeah, not doing it alone, had, doing it with someone who knows you super yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think if I was doing it by myself, I'd, I would have been uh, more afraid to make the leap. Um, well, it I makes also sense think, like the, oh, go ahead. I, mean, I was just going to say, we also, um, we talked to a lot of people before we made the jump. It wasn't like we were just like, he called and we did it. <laughs> um, we We talked to a lot of people that we both respect that, um, I've had success in lots of different places, some in real estate, some in others. And so anyway, we felt, um, every, everybody we talked to kind of believed in us. So I think that was, that was a big piece of the equation. That's awesome. And, and, um, yeah, I, I think it is profound what you said and of like already being in real estate, it's already such like an entrepreneurial space. Like yeah. you probably were already eating what you were killing, but now exactly. you get to eat a bigger portion of it and yeah. you don't have as much of a safety net. Like there's a little bit more higher risk and a little, and a little bit more higher reward that goes along with it. It's just sort of the next yeah. stage. Um, so you started this business in 2019 and Shortly thereafter, the world shut down. And one of the places I was really impacted was restaurants and retail yeah. and people like commercial spaces specifically. So I'm curious what that experience was like for you. A, how'd the business do? And B, how did your like mental health do when you're like, we just started this business <laughs> and now we can't like everyone, no one can gather. And you just said, I like building places where people can come and gather. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the short answer is, uh, not well all of it was we, we were we were not well the business was not doing well <laughs> my mental health wasn't doing well um yeah so we john and i started talking in the summer of 2019 um and then by the time we actually got up and running it was october of 2019 <laughs> so then you know within a, a few really months solid five months start <laughs> yeah and you know the the lead time on a real estate project is i'm you know, it takes months, if not years, to get into a project and start. And so, you know, we we brought on investors when we started and raised some money to get us started. Um, but you know, you don't you don't count on a six month just halt, and that's what happened. So, COVID hits. Everybody, even um, Chipotle, Starbucks, all these big guys, everyone just hits the brakes, completely stops, backs out of all the projects that they're doing. Mostly just because of the uncertainty. No one knew what was happening. Yeah. Um, we didn't know what was happening. I think similar to everyone, though, with COVID, um, I was so... It's not like we knew that this was going to be a two-year ordeal at the time. Every week, sure. you're kind of like, well, maybe this is going to end. That's um, true. You know? Right. Like what we made just, that so exhausting. Yeah, it did. So it's like a lot of stop and start through that. Um, and then what happened uh, that we were, you know, pretty fortunate in is a lot of the restaurants we work with have drive-throughs, mm -hmm. and 
the restaurant sales actually went up because people wanted something to do. I think people were yeah. like, let me get out of my house. Oh, I'm allowed to go swing by a Starbucks drive through. Let's do that. I'll wear a mask and do that. And so all of a sudden these guys sales, everybody hit the brakes. They stopped for about six months. And then as the data came in that their sales were up, they were like, all right, let's keep growing. So it was terrifying. Um, I was, you know, having all kinds of second thoughts. So, so was John. Um, started going to a counselor <laughs> at that point, which was good. Yeah. Really, really helped with my, my, uh, mental health through that and still, still do. Um, but yeah, we ended up being fortunate just because the drive through restaurants still did a pretty big business through COVID. Um, it's so interesting when you ask different business owners, how COVID impacted them and commercial real estate was one of like, probably the more brutal sectors, but you don't think about like, yeah, I remember going through drive throughs I remember restaurants in Virginia Beach have like using their parking lot to create like a drive through experience. Yeah. And just like part of all these businesses is they're also entrepreneurs. And so they're like, you're built to survive. You're like, how do we Gotta figure it out? Yeah. What do we how do we have to ebb and flow and, and transition just to like keep the doors open? Um, and so I wouldn't have even thought about drive throughs but you're like, yeah. That makes total yeah. sense. And that was like people, I remember myself being like, I just need to get out of my house. My wife and I would yeah. do, we call them walk tails. We just like make yeah. a cocktail and go walk. Cause we were like, yeah, what else do we do? <laughs> Can't go day drinking. Why not? Yeah, truly. You know, yeah. I mean, in Virginia beach, the beaches were closed. It was like, it's like the most wide open space with a breeze. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's, that's interesting. Um, and you guys have, I mean, since COVID continued to grow in a great trajectory, I mean, you have more and more business. You said you have a couple employees now. Yeah. Um, what is the direction? Is it just like keep sailing the same speed? Yeah. Is it like what, what's next for the company? So uh, it's a good question. Um, I think uh, there's a couple of different ways you can grow. I don't think that John and I, either one of us want to have a massive company. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see us ever getting to a point where we're more than call it 10 employees right now. There's, you know, four of us total. Um, we do, I do think we're looking to expand. Um, and that means probably bringing on a, another developer. So that's, that's technically my job. I'm a developer. Um, and so bringing on someone, kind of under me or next to me that would maybe cover a different geographical territory. That's kind of mm. the way you grow. So most of our projects are focused in the Carolinas right now, um, just because we're small and it, it makes life easier on us. Mm -hmm. um, but like, for example, the companies I used to work with, it was a bigger group. So we were covering huge territories. So like you take the clients you have, the hope is you take the clients you have and you expand with them to other places. Wherever they're going. Um, yeah. Yeah. I also, I mean, the other place that I think John and I would really love to expand is going back into more urban areas and working with um, more local restaurants. So I don't particularly find, I'm, I like what we do. I like the, the chasing of each project uh, and putting it together and building this thing from scratch. But it's not like I'm super excited about drive through fast food restaurants. That's not like my passion. Um, it's a good it's a good investment vehicle and it, it's it's a good business to be in. And, and it's relatively safe because when I go build a, a Starbucks, they're signing a lease for 10 years mm. and that's corporate Starbucks in Seattle. So unless they go out of business as a whole company, you're getting rent. Um, Hmm. So it's about as safe as you can possibly be in our space. Um, but, you know, if if I'm working with some local chef who's trying to open a restaurant in downtown Charleston, who knows if that's going to make it? Yeah. Um, you know, well, you I see. Mean, that's, my thought, that's my thought with like King Street is you're like, I go back to Charleston and it's, you know, different restaurants. Yeah, COVID, <laughs> yeah, COVID you know? did a number for sure. And, um, and so... And what would that look like from, I'm, this is just pure curiosity, like thinking about downtown Charleston or thinking about like a local chef doing that, 
those are all historic buildings. Yeah. Like, how do you develop that or retrofit it? Yeah. It's really, I mean, every, every city you deal with. So like, that's, you know, a lot of our job is just fighting with local government to get approvals for what it is that we're trying to do. Um, and it's not even like they're necessarily opposed. They just can't get out of their own way. Um, mm -hmm. And so it just, it takes longer than it should. But anyway, so each, each town, even if I'm in the middle of nowhere building a Starbucks, it's not easy, um, can be easier. Downtown Charleston obviously has a lot of historic regulations and whatnot, but it just is a longer time frame. So in more in paperwork doing so you, to get the approval, more time to get the yeah, approval. There's, a, there's an architectural review board in Charleston that's very um, sophisticated. And, and I actually think they do a really good job. I mean, I think that part of the charm of Charleston, mm -hmm. um, I think the, the architectural review board is, is really strong, um, but it adds probably another year on the front end of a project, just getting through wow. all the architectural review. So, and time is risk for us, right? So the quicker we can turn around a project, the better, because the market is less likely to fluctuate in that small period of time. Um, you know, the worst is when you get into a project, and we have a couple like this now, where we got into them a year ago, where interest rates were at 3%, well, now they're mm -hmm. at seven. And when we go to sell them, our properties are just worth less than what, mm -hmm. we, what we thought they were gonna be. Um, so anyway, the longer the time horizon, the more risk and being in downtown Charleston, getting through their permitting, that adds a lot Creates of risk. More time. Um, and so. how, from like a logistics perspective, I'm curious, like Starbucks comes and contracts you, do you get paid at the end of that? Like in two plus years, is it, are they paying you along the way? Like for you to no. keep the lights on, how does that work? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. So, um, we get paid at the end. So it's a it's a a long run. And so when we built our company, you kind of have to um, you've got to raise a lot of upfront capital to give you the runway to then get to that two year, three year mark um, when things begin where, to like close. Yeah, exactly. So John and I are in October's four years. Um, and so we've now built and sold several rounds of projects. And so you're able to pay off your investors on the front end and then start actually making more money. And, and in our initial capital raise, we built in salaries for ourselves. Um, yeah. They were, he and I both took pretty big pay cuts and it sucked. Um, but that's just part of starting a business. I mean, I think to just come out of the gates making more money than you did at your old job is not realistic. Yeah. Um, it takes, it takes some time to build. That's a quick, that's a quick way to go out of business. Yeah, for sure. If you're like waiting to pay yourself, give yourself a yeah. raise from your corporate job. Um, yeah. That's like part of the entrepreneurial pain and part of the risk. And I think why a lot of people shy away from starting their own business is like, totally. how am I going to support my family if this thing goes south or even just in the window it's going to take to get there. Yeah. Um, Okay, so for you, what surprised you most about this whole journey from em employee to employer, from, you know, DC, Charleston, office space, restaurants, just everything that you've been through, what has surprised you the most? Um, I think it's, it's harder. Real estate is, it's hard to, mm. the development side, especially developing real estate is difficult. Um, it's way harder than I ever thought it was going to be. Um, I, also it just takes way more time, right? Like you think kind of like, you know, you said when a Starbucks opens, there's like a good two year runway of a lot of thought, a lot of variables, a lot of things that are out of my control too, mm -hmm. um, that you're relying on to happen. and to have any kind of success. So I think the the time that it takes and also just the, the lack of control is mm. uh, not what I was anticipating when I got into it. Now I'm used to it um, at this point, but I hated it for a while. 
and made me question whether or not I wanted to keep doing it. Mm. Um, just because, yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm a, probably says a little bit about me that I'm a control freak maybe, but, um, not having, you know, full control over a project is, is tough. Um, yeah. I mean, well, especially when there's a lot we're of risk. all built to like mitigate pain, like in investing, yeah. just as an example, like people enjoy gains less than they feel pain on losses. Totally. And so like they want, they average person would rather mitigate losses than like experience gain and so i can imagine for you you're like there's so many factors out of my control like the yeah. interest rates the markets the company that is i'm working with covid national pandemics <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. You're, it's not as straightforward as like all right we're just gonna choose a property do some numbers choose a property and and build it it's there's so many other things that can blow the wind in different directions for you yeah. I also think the other the other thing that you don't really think about is like when you're working for another company, they do have this platform that they build. Um mm -hmm. where, you know, even just bookkeeping and insurance and, you know, office space and computers and all the things that you just kind of don't put a lot of thought into. Mm -hmm. Um the back of house stuff, you know. I think you take that for granted when you're an employee ready to jump to go start your own thing, or at least I did. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people do that. So that, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't sleep on that part of totally. starting a business. I think that is probably one of the biggest, like, pain points for most entrepreneurs. I would say, like, even just on this podcast interviewing different people, there's people who love business. Like, they love that stuff bookkeeping, taxes. They're like, we could sell anything. I don't care what it is. I just like the business yeah. piece of it. And I think that's fewer than the people who find something else they enjoy, commercial real estate, finance, art, whatever it may be. Yeah. And then you're like, I can do this on my own. Cause you can, you can do the trade itself. Right. But then you become a business owner and you're like, well, crap. Now I need to like figure out, I need to give time to my bookkeeping. I need to give time to thinking about, you know, my taxes and my employees and my insurances and, you know, all that that takes to run a business just to keep it like up to code, <laughs> you know? Right. And, it, and when you're starting out too, you don't even have the money to pay the accountants or all, the, all these other third parties that you would love to just pay to just deal with it. So yeah. you've got to figure it out yourself. It's your only option. You're just like um, swimming in QuickBooks. Like, I don't know. Yes. I think totally. this is right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly right. I know. Um, so what was the low point for you in the journey? Yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely the spring, summer um, of 2020 with COVID. It was just terrifying. Mm -hmm. You just, um, you just start to question why did we do this? We're building restaurants. And as the reality of COVID sat, set in um you start to think more and more about okay people are never going to go to restaurants again what are we going to do um it it was bleak there for a little bit and so i had you know full panic attacks and breakdowns and just didn't know mm. um kind of what what to do or where to turn um so yeah that was that was the low point i also think this last year has been really hard um you know, interest rates have just shot up. Mm. And so that really hurts us. Um, you know, we're somewhat insulated, you know, like guys that are building apartments and things have gotten hit harder. Um, but it's just been a, it's just been a rocky road since we got started. So, um, but at the same time, you know, we feel like if we can get through these hurdles, that is uh, making us stronger. Yeah, definitely. Um a question came to mind that I wanted to ask earlier, but had forgotten. So I want to pause before I get your definition of success. Yeah. You and Blakely are both self-employed. And I think Ooh. a lot of people, when they start their business or just own a business, the other spouse has a salary, has a steady income, or, you know, Insurance. might be a stay at home mom, but like you guys are both independently dealing with this world of variable income and, um, you know, running a back office. So what has that 
been like for both of you to be business owners? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's scary for sure. And it, it stinks because prior to me starting my business with John, you know, I, I had worked for companies, so I had benefits of those companies. Whereas Blakely mm. has been an artist for quite some time, doesn't have benefits. So she was using mine. So all of a sudden that was a, a huge part of the equation when we were trying to decide whether or not I should do this. So all of a sudden we're, we're paying for our own insurance. We have zero benefits. Um, and, and that was, uh, definitely hard decision to make. I think we we're fortunate in that Blakely, we weren't starting from scratch at the same time. She already had sure. started her business and had some success. Um, so it made it a little less daunting, um, for sure. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I think people don't, I think people underestimate the value of having benefits where like yeah, someone exactly. else is willing to pay half to three quarters of your health insurance and per can provide yeah. you a better plan than just you can provide yourself just paying astronomical amounts of money independently that having someone who matches your 401k yeah having a 401k um there's so much there that i think similarly like when i jump ship it was a conversation for us but i don't even think i fully understood like wow okay yeah, we, I need to come up with my own benefits plan <laughs> or like I need to be able right. to well, provide this. Exactly. And it's one more thing that you have to think about too. You've already, as, as you've jumped into entrepreneurship, you've got a lot that you're trying to think about with just your business. And now all of a sudden it's kind of changed your personal life massively. Yeah. And you've got to learn about health insurance, you know? Yeah. Um, you've got to, you've got to try and figure out all of that on your own. And it's like, you've already got all this new data you're trying to absorb. And now there's personal life stuff that comes with it. Um, yeah. So, the, yeah, the room think... in your head gets filled up pretty quickly. Absolutely. And over time, I think, like you said, as you push through, as you find success, as you get these systems in place, it, it becomes easier. Like, you know how to do your bookkeeping or you're able to pay for someone to do that. You, right. you know, you kind of get through that, but in an initial hump where you're already taking such a big risk and you're already thinking about so many pieces to also have that is definitely like a huge jump. Yeah. Um, so this is a podcast about success, but if for today's example, if you went out to King Street and just asked anybody on the road how they define success, you're going to get a different answer from each person. Um, so for you, how would you define success and how will you know if or when you've achieved it? Yeah, um, it's like obviously a big question. I think first thing that comes to mind is lifestyle. Um, I think that that's probably the the thing that I would point to, um, because you know, a lot of, yes, sure. Making money matters, but I think that we, we try and make money so that we can support a certain lifestyle. Mm. Um, and you know, if I can have time for my family, do a good job at work, have a balanced life of, you know, exercising, being with friends, all of these things, and also while trying to reduce stress, um, then I think you're succeeding. So mm. um, I think that I know a lot of people that make a ton of money, um, highly stressed people, burning the candle at both ends. Um, by most people's definition, that's successful. Mm. Um, I think I chased that for a while and um, realized that I would rather dial back a little bit and have more balance and kind of a more balanced lifestyle. So I, I think that is so wise of, I mean, we're just all climbing a ladder and you don't want to get to the yeah. top and realize it's on the wrong wall. And yeah. um, I think, 
what I tell people that I get to serve is, you know, money has two types of value. It has quantitative value, which says $100 can buy $100 worth of stuff. And then the qualitative value, which says, is what is that $100 worth of stuff doing for you? Like, how is it progressing your lifestyle or helping you build the life you want? And the quantitative value is only as valuable as the qualitative it provides. And right. which is like an interesting principle. But like you said, you know, you don't need more just to have more because you'll just be stressed and like, but to use your resources, your time, your business to create a balanced lifestyle where you're healthy, you're not stressed, you're spending time with the people you love, doing the things you love. Um, yeah, I also think I mean, it depends on it depends on who you are, obviously. So that's for me. I'm I'm just naturally a highly stressed person. So I think that's um, I've done a lot of learning and uh, particularly learning about myself. Um, and, and starting a company will force you to do that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, there are people that don't carry a lot of stress and they have crazy bandwidth and they can go, go, go. And, and what looks like an exhausting existence to me may not be for them mm. and, you know, more power to them. Uh, but that's just not my experience. Yeah. I, I'm in your camp. <laughs> I'm just like a a type A anxious human. And so, um, well, I appreciate all that you shared and just can't thank you enough for being on the Self-Employment Success Podcast today. Yeah, Leland, thanks for having me and um, yeah, I've enjoyed it. Uh, All right, (laughs) it's off.